I'm not sure where to go from here. I'm not even sure who I am anymore. For the last three years, he's been with me everywhere. We went to Capernaum. I sailed him across the sea. I put him in my boat. I, I served his fish and bread. I was just fishing when I met him. Who am I without Jesus? Let me take you. Let me take you back and show you what happened and what brought me here to this place. And let me show you how he was so much more than what I ever imagined. And now, he's going away. and sees all. I know you're looking down on us, on me. I know there's a great plan for all of this, but right now it, it just doesn't make sense. How could the one who came to save us not even save himself? <laughs> a little. We kept watch most of the night, fearing the soldiers might come to our home. What about you, Mary? Were you able to rest? No. I just kept seeing images of Jesus on that cross. I couldn't get it out of my mind. It's as if he let them crucify him. Yes. I, I sensed the same thing. He, he could have called down a legion of angels to his rescue. He could have struck down those soldiers. At the very least, he could have just got down off the cross, and yet, yet he chose to die. Now, I can't make sense of it right now, but I must believe that there was a greater plan. Look at us, faithful to the very end. He was the one to anoint and wash the feet of the male disciples, yet here we are wants to go and anoint his body. Do you think the guards will permit us to see him? The guards do not fear women. Well, what could we do to them? They know he is... Don't say it. Just don't. We will ask the soldiers to remove the stone so that we can go and apply these oils to his body. Surely they will not deny us this last rite of passage. <laughs> This can't be. The, the stone is rolled away, but he's gone. The, the body of Jesus is gone. There's nothing left but the head wrapping, and yet it's been folded neatly as if done on purpose. I knew we shouldn't have come alone. If the soldiers can steal the body of our Lord, can you imagine what they're planning to do to us, his followers? We must go and tell the other disciples. Will they even believe us? How can they not? We are here seeing the empty tomb for ourselves. We must go and alert our brethren. Shalom, Peter. Shalom, John. 
still doesn't feel right. Jesus not being here with us. I know, brother. It's been three days since the crucifixion, and yet I still feel like I'm there at the foot of the cross. I was such a fool to deny him. I should have been there with you. I should have been there with you all. He named me Peter the Rock. And yet when he needed me the most, the rock was the last thing I was. Brother, that is in the past. And remember, he already forgave you, so forgive yourself. And besides, we have much work ahead of us. And we really need you. You're right. The Messiah gave me instructions before he was led away. He told me, once I was restored, to strengthen my brothers and sisters, and I'll do just that. I will not fail him. Not this time. Brothers and sisters, we must stay alert. We must stay vigilant. Even though Jesus is no longer with us, we must remember that we are still his disciples. He's gone. He's gone. Hey, what's wrong? What are you talking about? Who's gone? The Messiah, Jesus. His body's no longer in the tomb. We believe the soldiers have taken his body. <laughs> what are you all saying? No, 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 you, you all must be overcome with grief. Jesus is dead and buried in Joseph's tomb. Mary, you were there when we buried him and even when we rolled the stone in front of the grave. It took six men alone to move that stone. Besides, those guards were standing watch all night. We know what we saw, an empty tomb. And the stone, the stone was rolled away. Someone has taken our savior and we must find him. If you don't believe us, go and see for yourself. Are you all sure you saw what you saw? Destroy this temple and in three days, I will raise it. Peter. 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 Yeah, what? They're convinced that his body has been stolen, so what should we do? Mary, if what you say is indeed true, then that must mean, well, maybe he has. We must go to the tomb. Wait, wait, Peter, you don't think he actually rose? Anything? He's not here. The soldiers must have, they must have stolen his body, but, but why? Why would the soldiers take his body? And how many men would it take to move this stone without the soldiers being aware? And where are the soldiers? What does this mean? You know what this means, John. You remember what he said. Everybody, search this garden and beyond. We must find him.
Woman, why are you crying? Who do you seek? I, I'm sorry. I, I'm looking for my savior. He, he was crucified. Yes, they crucified my lord. And he hung on the rugged cross. And all I could say was my own sin. My own guilt, my past, my shame. He died so that the world could live. So that I could live. My, what a beautiful garden. There's nothing beautiful about this place. All I see is a place where things are buried. Yes, it appears to be a burial ground, but I see a beautiful garden. Well, you see what cannot be seen. I see what is yet to be. Every garden has a gift, but in order for the ground to produce, the seed must be buried and then watered by heaven's tear. And then up from the ground in its season springs the evidence of life. Flowers and grass, fruit and trees, all growing from the gift of the seed planted in the garden. Woman, why are you weeping? I'm looking for my savior, sir. He, he was buried in a spiral tomb. You loved him. We all loved him. But his love for us was greater. It, co it cost him his life. I see. No greater love than this. Than a man who would give his life for his friends. Tell me, where are they? Where are the rest of them? They've gone to search for his remains. And you, why did you stay? There's just something about this place. I perceive you're the gardener here. Please, if you know where he is or have any idea where his body is, tell me so I can, I can go and anoint him. Mary. Mary, do not cling unto me. I have not yet ascended to my Father in heaven. Master. Yes. It is you. Mary, let your fear be gone. All is well. I have gathered the keys to death, hell, and the grave. The sting of death is gone. Hell has no victory over anyone who believes in me. Now, I need you to go. Tell the disciples what you have seen here. Their faith needs to be renewed. You tell them that you have seen me. And I must go ascend to my father, your father my God and your God. Jesus, you rose again. You are alive. You rose just like you said you would. Who would have ever known? Who would have ever thought that was just one touch, one touch was all I needed to know that
that it would be okay And one look One look was all he gave me And all of my fears ran away He freed me from the hurt That tried to hold me He freed me from the guilt of my past And he changed my story And never, never will I be the same since I saw him My life forever changed with just one touch I've seen him, Peter. I've seen him, John. And he's alive. Jesus is alive. Mary, are you sure? <laughs> I've never been more sure about anything in my life, Peter. I feel like we should sing. I feel like we should worship. Our Lord and Savior Jesus is alive. Looking for the end 
Acts 13, 28 through 35. And though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired they Pilate that he should be slain. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in the sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead. And he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God has fulfilled the same unto us, their children. In that day he raised up Jesus again, as it is also written, in the second song, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that, he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption. He said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore, he saith also in another song, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption a defining moment. It is important that you come back here. No matter where we go or what we do or where we live or what we drive or where we work, we must always come back here. This is the place indelibly etched into our minds, the substratum of our belief system, the fundamental idea through which our whole faith is built. It is not the superficial, superfluitous ideologies that you hear espoused often in our circles that makes us believers. It's not whether things go good or bad, whether they seem just or unjust, whether they seem fair or unfair, you are not a Christian because you're a nice person or because you do nice things or because you go nice places or you abstain from certain things. You're a Christian because there's always something that draws you back here. Now, I know this is a a strange place to be drawn because for some, this is a catastrophic place. For others, it is a disastrous place. And for some, I would dare to say that it is even a, a disappointing place because they did not expect Christ to be crucified the plans they had for him as they followed him and gave up everything to be with him did not include nails in a tree, blood running down his legs, a gasping sigh of death, a blackout in the heavens, a trembling of the earth, a shaking of the soil and the opening up of tombs. It didn't include any of that. It, they had in mind that he might overthrow the Roman Empire and become the king of the Jews. And they wanted to sit on the right and the left and, and have power. They didn't want to sit on the right and the left of, of a tomb. Disappointment there. This is a place that reminds us of betrayal. It is a place that reminds us that one of his own sold him for 30 pieces of silver. It reminds us that in this life we will be betrayed, no matter how good we are, no matter how well our intentions are, that ultimately somewhere along the way, we will run into someone who says that they're actually with us and in fact they really are not and they will betray us and we have to live with that. And as often as we come back to this tomb, it reminds us what it is all about that it's not about stuff, it's not about things, it's not about the accruements of life. 
It's not about the acquisition of fame or fortune or talent or people. The life is filled with tombs. Oh yes. Life is filled with tombs. The scripture I read in your hearing is to, is taken out of Acts. It is written where Paul comes to Antioch and he shares with them the story of the death, burial and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he does it in graphic terms. It is littered throughout the scriptures. It was prophesied from the very beginning. It is prophesied from the Old Testament to the New. It is reflected from the epistles to the book of Revelations. While the Old Testament looks forward to it, the New Testament looks back at it. And this is the hinge of our faith. It's right here at this rolling stone, this tomb, Golgotha's Hill, the bitter cup of gal, the taste of death in his mouth the slow trickle of blood running down his body, his legs, his thighs, now covered outwardly with what they once covered inwardly. And he died, openly, naked and unashamed. The Bible says that Genesis said Adam was naked and not ashamed, but here Christ is naked and not ashamed. The only covering that he had is not a garment such as this. He was covered with his own blood to remind us that his blood would be the covering and the propitiation of our sins. And as much as we come to this place, we honor the fact that this is what it's all about. Paul rehearses this in Antioch, and Antioch, incidentally, is the first place that we were called Christians. Before that, we had no real name. Some called us believers, and some called us the way, and some called us fanatics, and some called us fools. But at Antioch, we became Christians, because there Paul taught them about the cross. It is interesting to note that Paul did not always teach as flamboyantly about the cross as he did at Antioch. His first epistle was the book of 1 Thessalonians, where he scarcely mentions the cross at all. But as he walked with Jesus, he said, I am persuaded that I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. He didn't grasp that at first. But eventually he said, I count it all but dung that I may gain the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Oh, oh, that I may know him in the fellowship of his suffering and in the power of his resurrection. He became convinced of the cross. You must give him credit. Don't judge him too harshly. He wasn't there. when he hung his head in the locks of his shoulders. He wasn't there when the sun refused to shine. He wasn't there when the veil of the temple was rent from the top to the bottom. He was not there when the disciples fled to the upper room for fear of their lives. The apostle Paul was not there. He had not yet been converted. He missed the appearance in the upper room when Jesus walked through the door and showed himself alive and was man enough to eat fish and spirit enough to walk through the door. He wasn't, he wasn't there for that. So he, he's writing about something for which he was not initially an eyewitness to, but having experienced the road to Damascus is so engulfed his soul that by the time we hear him preaching in Acts, he professes to know nothing except Christ and him crucified. You must understand then, brothers and sisters, that this is our point of reference. This is the undeniable truth to which all of our faith hinges. It is flamboyant of God, opulent, I might even say, that he would attempt to draw us 
not with treasure or gold or silver or promises of heaven and streets of gold, but he drew us with an old rugged cross and a bleeding, suffering Savior to a graveside service. He says, whosoever will, let him come. What an invitation, an invitation to die. Jesus himself said, if you're going to be my disciple, pick up your cross and follow me. Follow me. Follow me. If you follow me and you're really in the will of God, it will lead you in here. It will lead you in here. Oh my God, it's so, it's so dark in there. Everything with God that matters starts in the dark place. From the creation in the book of Genesis when the Bible says the evening and the morning was the first day. It doesn't start with daybreak, it starts with night. For everything that God will ever do will always start in a dark, dank place. A claustrophobic place. A place that almost asphyxiates us. A place that we think that we cannot stand. It is not attractive. It is not beautiful. It is not opulent. It is not bedecked with jewels or precious stones or pageantry. Oh, no. It is a dark, dank yeah. hole, a cave, a cavern, a grotto. It all starts in the dark. Life itself starts in yeah. the dark. It starts in the womb of a woman where no light can shine at all. <laughs> An occasional moving of a knee or a jabbing of a toe down in the womb of a woman is where all life begins. And as we come to this cross, it is a defining moment because it is definitely a tomb. It is a tomb that has been borrowed for Jesus to use, not to stay. You never borrow something unless you know you won't need it long. It is absolutely a tomb. It is where the dead are placed. There is a place for him to lay and a death napkin to cover his face. The Bible says that when he rose from the dead with the luxury of utter confidence, he didn't leap up like I would have and run out the door. He sat up and folded up his death towel. Folded it up with the confidence of knowing that no man takes my life. I lay it down and if I lay it down, I'll pick it back up again. And he had the grace, the nerve, if you will, to be neat in the way he arose from the dead because this is a defining moment. It is not a distraught moment. It is not a chaotic moment. It is not a catastrophic moment. It is not a painful moment. It is a defining moment. It is a moment that will cost you your life. Yeah. It is a moment that you will be crucified for. It is a moment that you will be thrown into snake pits for. Yeah. It is a moment that you will be beheaded for. And you will do it willingly because of this defining moment. It is a moment where Stephen will be stoned to death and smiling looking up into the heavens at something better than this old world will ever be able to yes. afford. And he was able to smile because he had experienced yes. Yes. this one defining moment. A stone has been rolled away from a dark place. It is absolutely a tomb, but it is also a womb. You must realize that Jesus' tomb 
was a womb. There is some synergy between tombs and wombs. Tombs and wombs, tombs and wombs are always inextricably connected one with the other. There is little difference between the tomb and the womb. You must realize that. For a baby to be born into this world is to die from the world he lived in. He cannot be born to the present without dying to the past. He must forsake one in order to attain the other. He must leave the sanctity of the warm, dark cavern his mother has prepared in her very own body and be vacant to be absent in the body is to be present in the world. The tomb, our brothers and sisters, is a womb. But never forget that the womb, the tomb is also a womb and the womb is also a tomb. As you bury your loved ones and you put them in the tomb, always remember what I taught you, that their tomb is also a womb. It is a passage from one world into another. It is the gateway through which we access that that we can attain no other way. To be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. This is as much a womb as it is a tomb. It is our God who always incubates greatness in dark places. and small, stuffy, dank places, away from the scrutiny and the views and the expectations of men. He grooms greatness in isolation so that arrogance cannot fit in the tomb. Arrogance, arrogance, arrogance is too big to get inside the tomb because there, there are no crowds, there are no accolades there, there are no people there, there are, there are no applauds in the dark place. People always want to come out into the light where they can be exposed, but God does his work in the dark, in the shadows, in the dark place. And we must always come back to this. No matter how high you get, you must always come back to this. No matter how far you go and who loves you and how they care for you and how they see about you and how they promise you and how they're there for you, never totally buy into it because when all else fails and you feel like giving up and you feel like dying and you feel like quitting and you think you can't take anymore, all you ever have to do is come right back here and remember, greater is he. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. This is why he came. In the Old Testament, you see, their point of reference was the Passover night. It was the night that the lamb was slain. And when the lamb was slain and Moses had them put the blood on the doorpost and the lintel, it became the point of reference that all through the Old Testament, God referred to himself as, am I not the God who brought you out of Egypt? Am I not the God who brought you out on eagle's wings? Am I not the God who delivered you from the hands of Pharaoh? Am I not the God? He always referred them back because this is your default setting. It was the default setting of the early church, the Old Testament church. They couldn't look at the cross. It had the courage yet. They had to look at the shadow, which was the lamb, the innocent spotless lamb who was snatched out of the lamb pole that night of the Passover, wondering, what have I done? I have done no harm at all. And yet he saw the knife raised and he died, an innocent lamb so that guilty men could live. 
so that Hebrew slaves could become sons, so that the bound could become free, so that the shackled could be loose, so that the addicted could be liberated. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? The Old Testament church ecclesia called out, called out of their slavery, was called out only to always remember that it was through the blood of the innocent lamb that they were able to have the freedom that they were able to experience the pachal, the lamb, the lamb. The lamb was just a shadow of which Christ, Christ is our reality. Let us not forget that it is by his stripes we are healed. That he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. And let us not be so arrogant that we blame the Romans or the Jews because the truth of the matter is it is our sins that crucified the Lord. Our indulgences, our excessive behavior, our compulsive behaviors. It is us that crucified the Lord. He redefined what love is. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This was how God expressed love. This is God's love language. It's not acts of kindness. It's not pleasant words. It's not service. It's not touching. It's dying. It's God's love language. When God gets ready to show how deep and intense and rich his love is, he does it by dying. So much so that the Bible called the cross his passion. Can you conceive that God loves you with such passion that the only way he could find to express his utter adoration, his complete enthrallment with you, his absolute fascination with you, his complete love for you, his caring for what you've been through and how you've suffered and how you've endured that Jesus is the lover of our soul. And when he got ready to make love to us, he didn't rent a room. He borrowed a tomb and laid on a cross and died and called it his passion. God so loved, God, the infinite power, so to the infinite degree, love, the infinite emotion, the world, the infinite chaos, that he gave the ultimate gift, his only begotten son, the ultimate sacrifice, that whosoever believeth, believeth on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And if you don't believe that, then this is just another holiday for you to hang out with your friends, get high on your weed, get drunk off of your wine, have a good time and go play golf. But don't pretend to be religious if this is not a defining moment. If this is not the kind of moment that no matter how far you get out of his will, like a magnet, it keeps pulling you back keeps pulling you back to him over and over again. If this is not the kind of moment that no matter how far you get away from shore, it pulls you back like an anchor, back into your rightful place, then this is just a holiday to play games and have fun and enjoy yourself. Go to the strip club, have a good time. Celebrate the way you celebrate. But for us, It is a defining moment when life seems crazy, when life is confusing, when it's unfair, when you lose your baby. It defines the moment. 
When your husband walks away, it defines the moment. When you lose your job, it defines the moment. When you feel like you're about to lose your mind, Come on. On a hill. Far away. Stood it all. Rugged cross. Twas a wondrous attraction. For me. That's what it is to us. It's getting up power. It's resurrecting power. This is the defining moment because the greatest enemy in the world is death. And for Christ to overcome death means I can overcome debt, means I can overcome grief, means I can overcome pain, means I can overcome agony, means I can overcome trouble, means I can overcome rejection, means I can overcome denial. It means if he can get up out of this, I can get up out of whatever you send in my life. Come hell and high water. I'm just enough like my daddy to rise again. Oh yes, you might hold me down for a few days. You might have me shackled on Friday night, hands tied behind my back. You might have my finances shut down and my mind confused all day Saturday. But look out! Come on, my God! Look out! Because Sunday's coming. And they didn't make a stone he couldn't roll away. And I want all of you that are listening to me out there right now, no matter what dark hole you have climbed into, no matter what dark addictive hole you have succumbed to, no matter how dark and dank the hour may be in your life right now, I want you to hear me. The stone is rolled away and you can get out of this. This is your defining moment. It is not just for us to come and commemorate that Christ died for us. For the Bible says that if we are planted together in the likeness of his death, we, sh we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. He says, if you go down with me, you're going to come up with me. I won't take you into nothing that I won't get you out of. If I got you in it, I'll get you out of it. And you can overcome everything life put in front of you. Roll that stone. Roll it up out of your way. Roll it. Roll it. Roll it. Roll it, roll cancer, roll sickness, roll depression, roll suicide, roll fear, roll pain, roll agony, and then look back at it and say, oh, death, where's your sting? Oh, grave, where is, where is your, you thought you had me. That's COVID, you thought you had me. Yes, sir. But I got away. I got away. Millions didn't make it. But I am one of them that made it. To God be the glory for the things he has done. All that we have dramatized has already been realized. All that we have portrayed and depicted has already been accomplished. I am just wondering, where are you in this story? Who are you? Are you the Judas that sold him for your fun? Or maybe, 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 maybe you're the Thomas that doubted him and ran away. Who are you in this story? Are you the ones 
who nailed his hands to the tree? Or did you keep doing business in the presence of your Savior and cast lots for his clothes? Where are you in the story? In my life, I have known sorrow. In my life, I have known great pain. In my life, I have counseled and worked with people who have been through things that should have killed them. Victims of rape, a dark place. Victims of abuse, a dark place. Left by lovers in a dark place. Homeless people sleeping under bridges in a dark place. I've been in the prisons talking to inmates on death row who spent their nights in a dark place. I've seen mongoloid babies born with their entrails hanging out. They were in a dark place. But the reason this is a defining moment is that this proves that trouble don't last always. He rose from the dead so that you wouldn't have to be the first footsteps. He left a path in the ground to show you how to walk your way out of everything that ever tried to hold you down. And if you can't look up to the heavens, then look down for the footprints. Because whatever you've been through, he made it through. If he beat death, you can beat it by the power of the living God. It is a defining moment as I conclude I want you to understand the great thing is that it is a defining moment. The bad thing is that moments don't last. Moments don't last. If you're going to make a change, you have to do it now. The text said, it quotes from the Psalms, this day, have I begotten thee? Not just when your mama had you. But when you rose from the dead, you proved you were my boy. This day have I begotten thee. Would you consider being begotten of God? to come out of that cave and stop living in a place you should have borrowed. You were not meant to live there. Just because you lay there doesn't mean you have to live there. Come out. The angels have rolled away the stone and you have an opportunity and something you can't buy in any mall, you can't Google it, Amazon won't deliver it. I'm talking about eternal life. It's not in your cell phone, it's not an app you can download, but you can have it for free. Because once they roll the stone back, it never closed again. There is a way out of everything you're dealing with.
today. There is a way out of everything you are dealing with today. If you have the courage, just a simple courage, the simple courage, the simple courage, you may have to duck your head a little bit. You may have to humble yourself a little bit. You may have to lower yourself. You may even have to get down on your knees. But if you make up in your mind, you're coming out. You're coming out even if you have to hold on to something. Yes, sir. Even yes, if sir. you have to grab something and push yes, away. One foot at a time, little by little, day by day, yes, step by step. I'm, I'm not what I ought to be, but I'm not what I used to be. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm on my way out. I'm coming across. I'm coming over. I'm coming yes, through. Sir. That's how you get out of it. You don't always leap out, but you always come out. You come out because God has something out here for you that's better than where you've been laying. Yes, sir. Jesus laid in the tomb three days and three nights, but he did not live there. Yes. He came out with all power in his hands. And so can you. This day have I begotten thee. This day, 24 hours, this day have I begotten thee. This is the most important day in the history of the scriptures, not the parting of the Red Sea. This is the most important day in the scriptures, not when Noah got off the ark. This is the most important day in the scripture, not when Abraham's name was changed. This is the most important day in the scripture, not when the children of Hebrews came over into Egypt. This is the most important day in the scripture, not when Lazarus was raised from the dead. This is the most important day in the scripture, not when Mary was found with child. This is the most important day in the scriptures. God said, this day, have I begotten thee? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I want to say to you, you're running out of excuses. Wow. Help us. Talk, sir. And you, my friend, are running out of time. A day only lasts so long. I pray you make it out before the darkness that's in here gets out here. It's getting darker. Sir. And the hospitals have filled up. Sir. It's getting darker and the weather is unpredictable. It's getting darker. Sir. And people with degrees can't get jobs. It's getting darker. New diseases are coming from every direction. Sir. It's getting darker. If you're gonna make it to the light, you gotta do it now. Yeah. Cause it's getting late. Yeah. It's getting late in the evening. Hey. And the sun is going down. It's getting late in the evening. And the sun The sun Is going down Don't let this day can I pray for you before we leave? I want to pray for you that you might accept this Jesus into your heart, pull you out of your dark place, out into the open so that you can receive the marvelous light of his presence. I want, I want to just pray for you. I don't care what your net worth is. I don't care how many degrees you have. I don't care whether you're married or single. I don't care about any of the things that you put all your energy and effort to because none of it means nothing if you miss this day. Yes. This day have I been cutting thee. Yes. And you are running out of time. And right where you are, 
with tears welled up in your hands, right where you are, going through everything you're going through. Have you ever thought that maybe you're going through what you're going through because God is trying to tell you something? Just pray this little prayer with me. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Wash away my sins. Forgive me. I believe you died for my sins. I believe you rose from the dead. And this Resurrection Sunday, I'm getting up to. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. May heaven smile upon you. Let's praise the name of our God. Let's praise the name of our God. Let's praise the name of our God. Let's try it. Let's try it. Try your first praise. Try your first praise. Try your first praise. Try your first praise. If you never did it before, try your first praise. Try your first praise. First time, newborn, newborn, newborn again. Try your first praise. Amen. Yes, Lord. God bless you.
that our God is the risen King. Where they lead him, he won't be. Cause our God is the risen King. He's alive.